So for finding uh, the yield strength value and for finding the uh, ultimate stress value, we are going to use tensile test. And to check the ductility, we are going to conduct uh, bend testing for the material. And for finding the hardness number, we are going to uh, do hardness testing, either ruffle hardness or uh, brindle hardness. And for finding the number of cycles, number of cycles in the sense, so even if the value of stress is very less, even if the value of stress is below the normal limit, but uh, when you are applying for a very long time, like say the ship is operating for 20 years, 25 years, the same kind of loading is being applied for n number of cycles. I will give some examples, suppose we have computer, we have a mouse, we have a keyboard. What about the mouse? I am clicking the mouse for daily, I am cl uh, clicking the mouse like 1500 times. So in a year, I am clicking like uh, 5000 times, 10,000 times. So the same force, I am giving the same force, but in a year, I am giving 5000 times, 10,000 times. Each each product, each structure as an, uh, uh, like what do you call it? It will fail after a number of cycles. That is fatigue. So we are going to conduct fatigue test to find out uh, what is how much how much years the ship will be safe without fracture without failure how much cycles it can run okay and toughness test uh, we, are, we are going to find the notch toughness uh, using uh, char p impact test to find out whether uh, uh, like uh, what is the toughness levels so that it can resist the fra fracture okay First, we will start with the uh, tensile test. I will play a video for you. Conducting tensile test, 500 diameter tensile specimen, stainless steel material. Tensile specimen between cross heads. Apply extensometer to determine yield strength of material. After yield strength has been determined, remove extensometer and continue test to failure. So what we are going to do is, can you see the screen, all of you, can you see the screen? Yes sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this blue color is your test specimen, we are going to take this material in cylindrical form, okay, the test specimen is in cylindrical form, what we are going to do is, we are going to apply tensile force, tensile force means a force which is going away from the body, on the top and the bottom, so when you are applying the tensile force, what will happen to length of this? length of this will increase length of this will increase and uh, what happens when you are applying the force it will start deforming deforming <coughs> means it is elongating length is increasing it is elongating when this elongation is taking place stresses will develop in inside the object stresses will develop in the material so till some point the stress is directly proportional to strain till some point till some point the stress is directly proportional to strain. Uh, this region we call it as elastic limit. But after that, when you keep on increasing the load, what happens? 
even uh, stress will be same the stress will not be increasing but the strain will be too much the material will be elongating too much without increase in stress now the stress and strain are not proportional so this this point is called yield point and after the yield point the material will go into plastic deformation what you need to understand is if the deformation is inside the elastic limit if you are if you are stop if you are stopping the force then what happens the material will come back to original original position but once the uh, material goes into the plastic deformation it don't come into the initial uh, position okay the initial structure it don't come to the initial shape and size can you understand and when you are applying the force continuously at one point of time it will break how it will break there is a neck formation there is a neck formation and there is a fracture clear yeah. so what what machine we are using for uh, testing this uh, tension we are using universal testing machine utm in our college also it will be there in the mechanical lab this is called utm universal testing machine so what are the parts of utm they will be in uh, lower cross head and upper cross head okay so uh, this golden color what you can see those are jigs jigs means for fixing the specimen and a small rod you can see here no can you see the mouse cursor can you see the mouse cursor yes sir this small rod is your test specimen you are fixing the test specimen in the jigs and the upper upper cross head can go up upper cross head can move upwards this upper cross head can move upwards and when the upper cross head is going upwards what will happen to the specimen there is a tension force applied on the specimen so because of this what happens tension force is applied the material will start elongating then the neck formation will be there after that fracture so what we are going to do in this uh, load control is we are going to slowly increase the load see when this cross uh, this cross head is going upwards uh, we can calculate what is the load that is applied on the test specimen it will automatically give the value what is the load that is applied on the test specimen fine you can see in the load dial what is the load what is the tensile force that will be given in the load dial understood then to the test specimen you have to put, you have to fit strain gauge you have to fit strain gauge strain gauge is an electronic sensor electrical sensor for measuring the strain in a material so if you are fitting a strain gauge it will give what is the strain that is that is uh, like in the test specimen okay from there you can measure the strain value okay same diagram this is a specimen this is the upper cross head lower cross head okay like uh, any, any one of this will go in opposite direction so that there is a tensile force acting on the specimen this specimen is fitted to extensometer or strain gauge for measuring the strain how much is the elongation for measuring the strain in the change in length we can fit a strain gauge or an extensometer fine so this is specimen and what is the uh, gauge length gauge length is 2 point you are marking on the specimen before the test you will measure the gauge length after the test you will measure the gauge length okay before the test you will measure the gauge length after the test you will measure the gauge length to find out what is the elongation to find out what is say before the test uh, the the height of this uh, specimen is like say 10 cm or say 20 cm after the test it will be like 23 cm or 24 cm so we are going to measure it how much is the increase in gauge length okay so normally for ship building uh, tensile test the material will be like this you will have uh, a cylindrical uh, rod with a reduced diameter in the middle and the specification is actually the diameter is the length should be five times the diameter suppose the diameter is say Uh, 5 cm length of the specimen should be 25 cm okay that is a specification given by the classification societies for conducting tensile test for ship building steels so this is the uh, development of neck when tensile force is applied 
there will be neck formation somewhere in the uh, gauge length and uh, once the ultimate stress value reaches then uh, it will go to the breaking breaking stress limit and it will break so it will break in form of a fracture you can see the fracture image fracture image in this so this is the way it happens this is a stress strain curve someone ask you uh, draw the stress strain curve for uh, steels you can draw like this uh, try to understand this curve the horizontal axis gives strain the vertical axis gives stress horizontal axis gives strain and vertical axis gives stress what is formula for stress newton by newton per meter square what is formula for strain what is formula for strain what is formula for strain change in length by original length okay now uh, when when the when the stress level is increasing the stress and strain are increasing proportionally you can see it is going like a line it is going like a line when stress is increasing strain is also increasing it is going like a line it is going proportional after some time say at this point with a small increase in stress strain is increasing too much so if it is going towards right side that means strain is increasing if it is going towards top stress is increasing so after some time with a small increase in stress strain is increasing too much so this point we call it as yield point so this point we call it as yield point yield, yield point is what it is the maximum limit of elastic elastic stage after that the material will go into uh, plastic deformation okay well, what you see in the plastic deformation with a small increase in stress value the strain is very large fine and uh, this point m m is the maximum tensile strength of the material this is the maximum load that the material can withstand and this is the maximum stress value that the material can withstand fine so and after that the stress value decreases but the strain value keeps on increasing that means the elongation is keep on taking place and after some time at point f the material will break the material will break you can see the pictures the picture shows the state of a specimen in this there is no elongation slowly the length of the specimen is increasing neck formation is started to take place and fracture finally the fracture so uh, this kind of stress strain curve you will see for uh, the mild steel and low strength steel and uh, this kind of stress strain curve you will see for aluminum and high, high tensile steels i'll explain the difference uh, there is something called yield phenomenon yield phenomenon in the sense after the yield point after the yield point there is a small reduction in stress value there is a small reduction in stress value even though the stress is decreasing strain is increasing okay even though the stress is decreasing decreasing means going down stress is going down strain is increasing strain is increasing means going towards right side okay this is a graph now you can understand a graph so this is a yield phenomena that will be there when materials which have uh, very good strength good strength in sense which are, which are having good hardness okay the hardness is greater then uh, the curve will be like this if the material is not having uh, if the material strength is greater then uh, there is no specific uh, yield phenomena yield phenomena means the stress is not coming down it is going straight you can you can look at the difference here it is going down and going up okay here it is not coming down it is going straight understood so this this kind of stress strain curve you will see for aluminum alloys you will see for high tensile steels for all that the curve will be like this Next, we will go into the bending test. What is the purpose of bending test? To measure ductility of the material. Okay. To measure ductility of material, we are going for bending test. Bend test.
see bending test is carried out for uh, you, you take your uh, electronics no phone your phone laptop what we do sometimes we accidentally we apply a force on the phone uh, we apply a, a force on the phone we, suppose the phone will be on a sofa or a bed what you will do you will go and sit on the phone so the times the phone has to bend if the phone is not bending what will happen the display will crack inside uh, the phone there is an uh, motherboard the motherboard will break after that you cannot use the phone so how the phone is manufactured good companies will conduct the bending test they will design such that even if a, if a, a person is sitting on the phone the phone is not going to break okay uh, the phone has some bending uh, properties it is like little bit uh, uh, soft and ductile okay not ductile it is little bit soft and it can bend This video shows a four-point bending test. These are called uh, this the stillness, no? The stillness are called mandrels. This stillness are called mandrels, and uh, this is actually four-point bending. Uh, we can do three-point bending also. Timber beam with the grain running parallel to the beam axis. The beam is made of softwood pine class C24. The loading diagram shows the simply supported beam subjected to four-point bending. Under this loading arrangement, the bending moment in the central part of the beam is constant. A pair of equal vertical loads is now starting to be applied to the central part of the specimen, and we begin to see the beam bending under the load. This continues until the extreme fiber stresses in the tensile zone reach the failure strength of the wood and brittle fraction occurs. Now, let's slow that down and look closer at the point of failure. We can see bearing deformations accumulating under the loading hex. However, stresses continue to increase in the central part of the beam. Soon, the tensile strength of wood in the bottom fiber is reached and a fast-growing crack develops. The force displacement graph shows an initial linear elastic response in a higher than the compressive strength. So as the wood in the compressive zone begins to crush, the bending behavior becomes nonlinear. Therefore, some redistribution of stresses takes place. This is three point bending. This white color is your uh, plastic specimen, polymer specimen, and uh, three point, three mandrels. We are applying a force from the top mandrel. It is bending. This is like force versus uh, the stress. And when it breaks, the stress will become zero. Okay. So, checking the how much is the bending. So bend test is used for measuring ductility and uh, the specimen is bent around a mandrel or speci specimen diameter. Can you guess like uh, if the ductility is more, will the material bend more or less? If the ductility is more, the material will bend, uh, the bending radius will be uh, lesser or greater. You take a specimen. You take a specimen. If if the bending radius is uh, very small, that means the ductility is very good. If the bending radius is very large, that means the ductility is very less, but strength is very good. 
okay high strength materials cannot be uh, we cannot bend high strength materials too much this is uh, the blue color object is a specimen and uh, the brown color objects they are the mandrels you are going to apply the force from the top mandrel we have seen all this in the video and after that we are going to measure uh, what is the force we are applying and we are going to measure what is the deflection from that we are going to find the uh, ductility using a formula we are going to find how much is the ductility of the material understood next uh, hardness test what is the purpose of hardness test to check whether the material is good ag against abrasion Okay, for hardness test, what we do? We use uh, two tests: Rockwell hardness and Brindle hardness test. And uh, we will watch a video. See, so it is like uh, uh, we are going to give an impact force on a material. When we are giving an impact force on the material. There will be a dent formation. We are going to give an impact force using a sharp object. Some material is there, some specimen is there. We are going to give an impact force. Impact force means sudden force with a uh, sharp object. Sharp, sharp object we call it as in indenter. Uh, this sharp ob object will make a dent on the specimen, and by looking at the specification of that dent, we can find how hard the material is, how soft the material is. We can find everything from that. The Brunel Hardness Test Using the Brunel method, the hardness of a turbocharger housing is to be measured. First of all, the tester has to make himself familiar with the testing machine. A monitor and the control panel are positioned in the upper part of the machine. These are used to select and program different testing methods. Below the control panel, a microscope lens with a digital camera and an indenter are installed. These two elements are connected to each other and rotate towards the test piece as required. It is also possible to select and exchange the indenter, so different methods of hardness testing can be conducted on the same testing machine. The support table can be adjusted in and exchange the indenter. This is that uh, indenter, okay? Indenter means a sharp object. You can see the uh, tip of that. So different methods of hardness so testing can be conducted on the same okay. testing machine. So with this we are going to make the an support impact. table can be adjusted machine. in height, so the test piece can be positioned at the correct distance to the microscope lens and the indenter. After becoming familiar with the machine, let's start the experiment. The principle of the Brunel hardness test is to press a hard spherical indenter with an exactly defined force onto the test piece then evaluate the surface area of the indentation. The tester selects a suitable spherical indenter and inserts it into the holding device of the testing machine. You have to select a suitable indenter for a particular application, for a particular material. The classification society will give a specification. Choose this indenter. The diameter of indenter should be this much. The material of indenter should be this much. They will give the specification. Choose according to that. And the classification society will give a force also. Apply this much force on a material. They will give the specification for material, uh, the specimen also. The specimen should be this much broad, this much thick. They will give the specification also. You have to just follow the rules. And you have to conduct the test. Okay. Next, he puts the turbocharger housing onto the support table rotates the microscope lens into vertical position and adjusts the correct height of the test piece. After bringing the test piece surface into focus, he selects the exact spot where the hardness test is to be made. By pushing the start button, the hardness test procedure begins. The testing machine rotates the lens back to its resting position and places the spherical indenter carefully on the test piece surface. Gradually and shock-free, the test force rises to its specified value. After maintaining the test force for a certain time, the indenter automatically lifts off again and the microscope lens pans back to its former position. So, uh... Lens pans back to its former position. 
So what they are doing is after making an indention, after making a dent, after making a dent, they are going and measuring. They are going and measuring the diameter of the dent. They are going to measure the measuring the depth of the dent. They are measuring everything by measuring the depth, the diameter, and the surface area of dent. They can substitute in a formula and they can find the value of hardness. Simple. The indentation can now clearly be seen on the monitor. Now uh, this is very advanced system. So uh, using a microscopic lens, they are seeing the indentation on a computer screen, and uh, the, uh, the computer will automatically measure the diameter. It will measure the depth of uh, uh, the indentation. Everything it will measure. Okay. With the control knob, the tester places four measuring lines on the edges of the indentation the to diameter. measure its diameter. That's it. The testing machine can now calculate the Brunel hardness. Try to understand for a, for a, a different materials, we are giving same force, but the diameter of indentation will be different. The hardness value is defined as test force F in the old unit kilopond divided by the area of the indentation A in square millimeters. It is the formula you can uh, find the hardness, Brunel hardness is equal to test force by the surface area of indentation. Okay. The result is displayed on the bottom left hand corner of the screen and amounts to 250. Next, uh, in Rockwell hardness, what we are going to do is we are going to the same process, but uh, we are going to use a diamond cone or even a small uh, a cylindrical, a sp spherical cone, but we are going to measure uh, the depth of indention, not the surface area, we are going to measure the depth. Rockwell hardness test, scale C. In this video, we will show how the Rockwell hardness test works using a gear wheel. The basic idea of this test method is to measure the permanent depth of indentation of a hard indenter under a test force. In the process variant scale C, a rounded cone made of diamond is used as an indenter. In step 1, the diamond cone is pressed onto the test piece surface with a minor force of 10 kilopons. The depth of indentation under this preliminary load is the reference point. In step 2, the test force is increased by 140 kilopons, which is acting as the major force. This means that an overall force of 150 kilopons is now acting on the indenter, and this force is held for a certain time. In step 3, the major force is removed again. While the minor force is still acting, the permanent increase in depth of indentation E is measured. This is how the Rockwell hardness is calculated. Rockwell hardness HRC is equal to 0.2 minus permanent depth of indentation E in millimetres times 500. Let's take a look at how the test is carried out in practice. The tester selects the conical diamond indenter and in this is conical uh, diamond indenter. stores it in the testing machine. Then he picks up the gear wheel and puts it on the support table. After rotating the microscope lens to its vertical position, he can adjust his test piece. As soon as a focused image can be seen on the screen, the surface of the test piece is in the correct height. The test can start. In modern testing machines, the Rockwell hardness test is fully automated. That's why the Rockwell hardness test is used so often in automated production lines. That's it. The Rockwell hardness of our gear wheel is 55 HRC. This result is displayed on the screen. In uh, the previous one, Brunel hardness, you have to again rotate the microscopic lens and you have to measure the diameter, then you have to, uh, the system will calculate the uh, hardness number. But in case of uh, Rockwell hardness, it is, the system will automatically calculate the hardness number. So what happens, this, this uh, Rockwell hardness test is used in many production lines. It is widely used than the Brunel hardness test. Okay.
which you know so actually uh, uh, you can find the tensile strength of the steel by hardness test also fine uh, if the hardness number is this much there is a relationship if the hardness number is this much then the tensile strength will be this much there is a relationship between the hardness number and the tensile strength but the problem is you cannot apply for all the cases suppose you take uh, a plate with a coating sometimes what they'll do they'll take a mild steel plate and they'll coat with an hard material on the outer surface so when you're doing hardness testing you're doing for the coating you're not doing for the entire material so what happens is you uh, come to a wrong figure that the strength is greater but the strength is actually less so homogeneous materials a, a plate which is made up of a single material without any coating you can calculate the tensile strength using hardness test also understood so this this uh, table gives if the hardness number is this much what will be the value of tensile strength so this is the shape of indenter used for brindle test spherical indenter and this are the indenters used for rockwell test this is a diamond cone uh, indenter this one is a spherical ball indenter apart from this there are many other uh, test also we have uh, new micro hardness test we have wickers micro hardness test so these are the shape of indenters and uh, this is specification like how much load we need to apply and what is the formula for finding the hardness number so this uh, table gives all that okay and for the rockwell hardness test we have to measure this they, they don't know we have to measure e and we have to put in the formula to find out uh, the rockwell hardness number this uh, this black color is the initial surface of the specimen this is the initial surface of specimen when we are applying force using this indenter the indenter will go inside this material it will pierce and it will go into the material it will not pierce it will make a dent and it will go into the material what happens is the surface will uh, slightly it will uh, deflect downwards and uh, this is the actual indention this uh, h is the actual indention and uh, uh, h is the indention tip from this initial surface that is h and h is how much the surface is deflecting so you have to measure all this then find e then substitute in the formula to find out hardness number and uh, next is toughness test Are you there in the video, all of you? Listening? Yes, sir. Okay. Charpy impact test. The standardized Charpy impact test has been designed to measure. See, what is the purpose of this test? We are going to find out uh, the fracture properties of. the material if the toughness is good then the material is not going to get fractured fractured means the uh, the crack development if the toughness is very good then cracks are not going to develop okay so we are going to find the toughness that means the ability uh, to resist crack formation toughness is nothing but what the ability to resist crack formation that is fracture ability to resist fracture the toughness of materials under impact loading and multi The Charpy impact test. The standardized Charpy impact test has been designed to measure the toughness of materials under impact loading and multi-axial stress state. A pendulum impact testing machine is used to do so. The pendulum on the machine has a heavy weight at the end. This is lifted into the starting position in step 1. Then the tester checks whether the testing machine has been adjusted accurately. In order to do this, he turns the drag indicator downwards and releases the pendulum without a test specimen. The drag indicator stops at position 0. This proves that the pendulum has the correct starting position and that the friction is correctly compensated. The machine is ready for the tests. First test, strain aged plain carbon steel S235. This is our test specimen. 
that has been machined to standardize size and shape with the characteristic V-shaped notch. The tester places the specimen on a support in the lower part of the machine and adjusts its position with a centering device. Next, he turns the drag indicator downwards again and checks that everything is prepared correctly. Perfect, the test can begin. The pendulum is released, it swings downwards and hits the specimen with its rounded hammer peen. The specimen absorbs part of the pendulum's energy, so the pendulum doesn't reach the full height on the other side. The amount of energy that has been absorbed by the specimen can now be read off at the position, just its position with the test specimen. Hello, and someone answered me, if you are dropping a pendulum from this height, how much height did you go on the opposite side? Suppose from the left hand side you are uh, leaving say at 2 meters, you are leaving the pendulum at 2 meters height, on the right hand side how much height did it travel? It will go to, it will go to 2 meters, okay, but what happens? Uh, this is the potential energy. Because of potential energy, it is going up to an height of 2 meters again. But what happens? In between, you have a test specimen. This pendulum, it is having a striker. It is having a striker. This striker is going and breaking that specimen. Because of breaking that specimen, uh, it is the, the pendulum is using some potential energy. It is actually spending some potential energy in breaking the specimen. So after losing, spending some potential energy, will it travel to the same 2 meter height? So without, without any, any disturbance, if you are living at 2 meters, it will go to 2 meters. If you are living at 1 meter height, it will go to 1 meter height and it will come back. Okay, but uh, when, when it is spending some energy, when it is spending energy in breaking a specimen, will it go to height of 2 meters? No, it won't go. It will go to say it will go to height of 1.5 meters and it will come back. So the difference in height. It should go to 2 meters, that is the potential energy, but now it is going only to 1.5 meters. So what about the remaining 0.5 meters? That is because of the energy lo loss because of breaking the specimen. The energy lost because of breaking the specimen. So from the height difference, we can find out how much energy we spend in breaking the specimen. From that we can find the toughness. Okay. Listen carefully. The drag indicator stops at position 0. This proves that the pendulum has the correct starting position and that the friction is correctly compensated. The machine is ready for the tests. First test, strain aged plain carbon steel S235. This is our test specimen. See what they do is, in the test specimen, they'll make a notch. Actually fracture will take place if there is a notch or if there is a crack only. So what they'll do, they'll make a notch. They will make a notch like this and uh, the striker, no striker means the heavy, heavy uh, object. The striker with heavy, that is with, uh, heavy mass with a sharp uh, front end. The striker is going to come and hit in the opposite end. It is not going to hit in the uh, notch area, it will hit in the opposite to notch. It will hit opposite to the notch and it will break the specimen into two pieces. After breaking this, this that uh, striker will be keep on oscillating. Okay. It has been machined to standardize size and shape with the characteristic V-shaped notch. The tester places the specimen on a support in the lower part of the machine and adjusts its position with a centering device. Next, he turns the drag yeah. indicator downwards again and checks that everything is prepared correctly. Perfect, the test can begin. The pendulum is released, it swings downwards and hits the specimen with its rounded hammer peen. The specimen absorbs part of the pendulum's energy, so the pendulum doesn't reach the full height on the other side. The amount of energy that has been absorbed by the specimen can now be read off at the position of the drag indicator. It only amounts to 13 joules in this test. Here is the main principle of the measurement. In its starting position, the pendulum only has potential energy. It is given by mass of the hammer M times gravitational acceleration G times starting height, capital H. After the pendulum has been released, the hammer moves downwards, hits the specimen and then only swings to height, small h. 
Exactly at the first reversal point, the pendulum again only has potential energy, which is m times g times small h. The energy that has been absorbed by the specimen is called notch impact energy, kV. It corresponds to the difference between the two potential energies. Perfect. The test can begin. The pendulum is released. It swings downwards and hits the specimen with its rounded hammer peen. The specimen absorbs part of the pendulum's energy, so the pendulum doesn't reach the full height on the other side. Everything is prepared. Next, he turns the drag indicator downwards again and checks that everything is prepared correctly. Perfect. The test can begin. The pendulum is released. It swings downwards and hits the specimen with its rounded hammer peen. Can you see this? It the swings notches downwards on, notches and on hits the notch is on this side. The striker is hitting on the opposite side. Okay. Striker is hitting the specimen in opposite side of the notch and it is breaking the notch. Specimen with its rounded hammer peen. The specimen absorbs part of the pendulum's energy, so the pendulum doesn't reach the full height on the other side. The amount of energy that has been absorbed by the specimen can now be read off at the position of the drag indicator. It only amounts to 13 joules in this test. Here is the main principle of the measurement. In its starting position, the pendulum only has potential energy. It is given by mass of the hammer M times gravitational acceleration G times starting height, capital H. After the pendulum has been released, the hammer moves downwards, hits the specimen and then only swings to height small h. Exactly at the first reversal point, the pendulum again only has potential energy, which is m times g times small h. The energy that has been absorbed by the specimen is called notch impact energy, kV. It corresponds to the difference between the two potential energies. The first specimen only shows very little plastic deformation. A mostly flat, slightly glittering fracture surface has been formed. This is another important indication that this kind of steel is only able to absorb small amounts of notch impact energy. It shows mainly brittle behaviour due to the strain ageing effect. Second test. The second specimen has been made from normalised uh, did you understand little bit about this Charpy notch test? Hello? I'll show some pictures. Yes, sir. See, what we are doing? We are making a notch in the specimen. Notch means V-shaped notch. We are making in the specimen. And uh, this is a striker, okay? This is a striker. Notch, see the notch is on the right hand side, striker is eating or eating the specimen from the left hand side. Okay, so without this specimen, if you are leaving the striker, what will happen? If you this edge, this edge, say so the edge is 1 meter, if you are leaving from the left hand side like 1 meter, it will go to the right hand side also 1 meter, first oscillation. 1 meter will be equal to 1 meters, and then slowly, slowly it will decrease, that is like pendulum oscillation. But uh, uh, the first oscillation, when you are leaving the striker, it comes with a huge energy, potential energy, and uh, it strikes the specimen, breaks the specimen into two pieces. For breaking this, it will spend some energy, and it will it will not go to the same height. Like suppose one meter on left hand side, it will not go to the same height on right hand side. It will go to reduce the reduced height, HF. So this difference between H naught and HF, you can uh, find out how much is the energy spent in breaking that specimen. Okay, how much is the energy spent in uh, formation of crack for, for making the material to fracture? Understood? See this uh, uh, this yellow, yellow color object is your striker. Striker is a huge mass, but the front 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 part of the striker will have a sharp uh, edge. Can you see? The notch is on the other side. The striker is hitting on the other side. Yeah. You can call striker or hammer. So it is going to eat the specimen. Specimen is the red color. It is going to eat the specimen. Break the specimen. 
and it is going to go like this. Understood? So can we end the class uh, by this today? I will send this PPT. Uh, this topic is not that important to your uh, exam point of view. In exam from first chapter they are going to ask you what is the different grades of steel and uh, like what are the properties of steel. Only that, that they are going to ask. That is the regular question which they are going to ask. These things are like additional. I, they don't come in the exams. Okay, just for uh, knowledge purpose, you can have this PPT. Go through the PPT. Fine. Okay, we'll end okay. the class. Thank you. Tomorrow is Saturday, right? Saturday, yes, yes. No class. Okay. Saturday, if you have college, we have class. Otherwise, no class. Okay. We'll stick with uh, vice principal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Please fill that attendance. Please fill that attendance. I will send, send a mail now. Fill that attendance.